Today we're going to look at the most important services you should be familiar with within AWS as a software developer. Now you can see a list of a lot of these in my backend engineering mind map. So if you want to link to this, which will have all of the cloud services as well as many, many other things, then check out the link down below. This will give you a really good overview of pretty much everything you need to know to get started as a backend developer. Super valuable as well if you're going for a full stack engineering role but pretty much we're going to be going through a lot of these main ones for cloud services, specifically in AWS, Amazon Web Services. That's kind of bad. That was a really ugly face, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to see that. Now real quick before we get started, if you wanted to break into software engineering or advance your career in software, I have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program where you'll get guidance on building all of the skills needed to be a successful software engineer, as well as getting the help you need to have success in the technical interviews. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'll have a link to that down below as well. So to get started, this is the console. It's the homepage for AWS. You can add various widgets in here, such as your recently visited or cost and usage. The recently visited is going to list all of the services you've worked with. So these are the kinds of things we're going to work through in this video. So we're going to start with probably one of the most important ones you should be familiar with, which is EC2. So when you're using these services, you can also choose the region you want these services in. So there are a bunch up here. So if you go to one of these and something you created earlier is no longer there, you might just need to go to the correct region. So EC2 stands for Elastic Compute. This is their compute service. So if you need to create virtual machines, you would do that within AWS EC2. We'll just cover each service at a high level. If you need a virtual machine, Basically, you want a computer to run some application, you can use EC2. You can find the full list of services from this drop down here. The next one I want to talk about is S3. This is for storage, and this will be grouped in collections called buckets. You also often hear this is object storage, and an object is a file and any metadata that describes the file. So it's pretty much just to store files. So you might want to do this for the static files of your web page. So the front end, you can host static web pages from S3, but you can also use it for a destination for uploaded files through an app. So if you want the user to be able to upload a profile image, you can have that go to S3. Now there's like unlimited services within AWS. So even within storage, you can go to their products section and then storage. You'll see there's like 50 different options here, but S3 is their main one that everybody's going to want to know about. If you're trying to store stuff for archival purposes, you can look into S3 Glacier and you can read about some of the other ones here. The next service I want to talk about is RDS and this is for hosted databases. Now RDS is not the database. So within RDS, you will create a database such as Postgres. When you click create database, you'll see some of the hosted database options. So which you choose is up to you, but you'll host this within RDS. Now for this, you will choose the server size that you will use for the database. So it's a managed service, but you still have control of selecting what scale you want that to be at. This is different than a serverless setup, which is where you do not allocate a particular size for the actual server. So we'll look at serverless stuff here soon, but first let's just talk about this, which is just a managed database where you host it online. Easy to manage relational databases optimized for total cost of ownership. Amazon Aurora is MySQL and Postgres compatible at one tenth the cost of commercial databases. I've never used Aurora personally, but that's something you might want to look into. However, it's worth noting that when people are talking about Aurora, they're often also talking about Aurora serverless. So Aurora serverless is an on-demand database where you do not say, hey, I want the server size to be this. Instead, you just pay for the usage. You'll see some other serverless options within the database section here. So Amazon DynamoDB is their other big database, and this is a managed NoSQL database that is serverless. So DynamoDB is really targeting very quick response times, so single digit millisecond performance at any scale. Now as for NoSQL databases that are not serverless, you can look at the document DB section here. So Amazon document DB with MongoDB compatibility. So let's take a look at document DB real quick. 
So this is a JSON document database, and this is not a serverless service. So you will allocate a certain size based on how much usage you need. And heck, while we're on the topic of databases, let's take a quick look at Redshift. So this is a structured database for data warehousing. So if you're working with a lot of data and you need to do analytics, this would be the product of choice. Not something you would use for transactional processing like powering a website, but definitely a service you should at least know exists. And then last topic within databases is Amazon Elastic Cache. This is their in-memory caching service. They don't say it on the landing page here, but this will allow you to choose Redis or Memcached. So you can use this to improve the performance and reduce the load on databases. So we'll get started and then you can choose Redis OSS or Memcached. So far we talked about a lot of the main components that you could piece together to create a functional backend. So you could use EC2 for the server, then S3 for any storage of files, and then RDS for any databases. However, sometimes instead of working with EC2 directly, you might want to use a platform such as Elastic Beanstalk. So this will help you deploy and scale web applications. It'll just abstract away the details, making it easier to deploy an application. From capacity provisioning, load balancing, and auto scaling to application health monitoring, these are all things that Elastic Beanstalk will help you with. So you would use this to deploy a custom API, for example. If you wanted something simple to host, say, a WordPress website, I thought it'd be fun to mention another service here, which is LightSail, which will give you virtual private server instances. And this will help you create a website very easily. Probably not the service you would use for custom APIs, but I thought I would show you this because it's kind of cool. So you can go in here and you can click on a lot of these popular content management systems, as well as just a server, Nginx, or even a runtime like Node.js. So I've only ever really used this to launch a WordPress website, but it was a pretty decent experience. You can also just go with core operating systems here as well. Next up, we have Elastic Load Balancing. So when your application grows in users, you might distribute that across multiple servers. Or if you need fault tolerance, so if a server goes down and you want to automatically use another server, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with elastic load balancing. So this will automatically distribute incoming traffic across multiple targets. Now when you're building a real service, you're likely going to want a custom domain name, you're going to want HTTPS, and you'll want to familiarize yourself with a CDN. So we're going to talk about some of those services now. So first up, we have Route 53. This can be used to purchase domain names. Now you don't have to have your domain in AWS. However, it might make things a little bit easier to set up uh, having everything in one place. But from within Route 53, you can search for a domain, calebschoolwebsite.com. Oh man, someone took that. Are you kidding me? Who would buy that? But you'll definitely want to do this if you are working on a service and you actually want people to use it versus using some of the default endpoints that AWS is going to give you. On top of that, you're going to want your service to be HTTPS. So this is going to use a TLS certificate or an SSL certificate you may also hear. This is all going to be done within a certificate manager. And now you should have pretty much everything you need to build a service that has its own domain name, is secure, but there are still other services you'll want to know about to make the entire process easier. One of these is AWS Code Pipeline, which is continuous delivery. So if you're interested in CI, CD, check out AWS Code Pipeline. This isn't really a requirement, but if you want to push code to a certain branch and have that automatically deploy, possibly do some other steps in there, such as testing, then this would be the tool for you. Now, AWS actually has a couple of different services related to this, code commit, code build, and code deploy. You can kind of think of AWS code pipeline as the full system, which will use these other tools to make this possible. So it takes code from code commit. I think you could use tools like GitHub as well, builds and tests using code build, and finally deploys using code deploy. Next up, we have AWS identity and access management. This is where you decide the permissions users have. So you can create a sub user, give it limited permissions. So you're not just working within your root account that can do anything. You also work with IAM when it comes to services working together. Now, if you manage to make it this far, you have an application out there, but you want to make sure things are working right. You'll look into monitoring with Amazon CloudWatch. 
So this can help with logging, charts, and notifications if anything goes wrong. So you can set alarms, automatically react to changes, and gain a unified view of operational health. That way you're not just continually refreshing your website to make sure things work. You can set up CloudWatch to watch that for you. Now let's talk about CDNs, content delivery networks. Once you have a site up there and you want to improve the performance, a CDN is going to help a lot. This will cache files and distribute them around the world. And when someone makes a request to your website, they will be given the files that are closest to them so their request doesn't have to travel as far. So it acts as a cache and it makes those files closer to the person. Now let's talk about AWS Lambda, which is a serverless function service. So if you need to execute some section of code without worrying about the computer resources, Lambda might be for you. Say you want to execute some code consistently on a schedule or respond to some kind of event. This is something that would make sense to use AWS Lambda compared to setting up something through Elastic Beanstalk, for example. Now, if you end up containerizing your application, you might be interested in ECS or Elastic Container Service. So this will help you deploy, manage, and scale containerized applications. Now for image hosting, Amazon Elastic Container Registry will allow you to do that. So the container service is for running containers. The registry is just for storing the images. Now ECS can be deployed to EC2, or you can also deploy to Fargate. This is serverless compute specifically for containers. So the main difference of whether you would want to deploy to Fargate or EC2 is if you want it to be serverless or managed VMs. So if you want to provision certain sizes and not go the serverless route, then you could deploy to EC2. Or if you just want to pay for exactly what you use, Fargate. Now, if you want to go a step beyond Docker and work with Kubernetes, Amazon has an elastic Kubernetes service as well. Next up, we have CloudFormation. This is an example of infrastructure as code. It's basically where you describe the infrastructure you want to use within AWS, but instead of going in the console and setting everything up, you describe it in a file that can then be used to automatically provision all of those services. This is valuable because it can give you a very consistent infrastructure that you can destroy, recreate immediately, and you'll have a file that you can put in version control and keep track of the changes over time. This will basically give you what they say is a turnkey application distribution. So automatically provision resources, manage infrastructure with DevOps, scale production stacks, and share best practices. For example, define an Amazon virtual private cloud, another service you can look into if that's needed. Next up, we have SQS, Simple Queue Service. This is a means of communication between services. So if you have a microservice architecture, you might be familiar with queues. It is a first in, first out queue, and it helps you make sure the message you send to systems are published in the correct order. So definitely an interesting tool if you are working with different services that need to communicate with one another. The next service I want to mention is Amazon Simple Notification Service. Amazon Simple Notification Service sends notifications two ways, application to application and application to person. So you can use it for many to many messaging between distributed systems and microservices and event driven serverless applications. Or you can send messages to your customers with text, push notifications and email. So this is another means of communication between apps and making notifications for customers. And the last one I wanted to mention here is Amazon Simple Email Service. Optimize your email communication with reliable, scalable, and secure solutions that ensure compliance and efficiency at competitive prices. But what does it do? Basically, it will allow you to send emails. That may have been obvious for some of you, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, this would be used to, for example, send a registration email when somebody registers for your application and you need them to confirm their account, or if you need to give notifications about something that's happening in your app, it can integrate into any application for high volume email automation. So this is not an email marketing platform like ConvertKit or MailChimp, this is an email infrastructure. So you would use Amazon SES to build a tool such as a marketing email platform. So that's a brief intro to some of the major Amazon Web Services services that you should be familiar with.
If this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like, send it to someone who might benefit from having a better understanding of AWS. As a reminder, I have the resource links down below, which will be a link to the massive backend engineering mind map, as well as a roadmap of what to learn in what order. And if you need additional guidance through that, we have the one-on-one -on -one mentorship program, which I have a link down below as well. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for upcoming videos. We might do some more hands-on with this stuff. So let me know which of these services is most interesting to you and what content you would like to see about them. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for upcoming content.